Hi students, welcome back for your Unit 2 Desert Grasslands Reteach. Follow along, answer questions, and hopefully you will be successful on your retake of Unit 2. Alright, let's get started. Alright, so this test was about deserts and grasslands. So let's talk about some characteristics about each one. The desert. So first of all, tell me how much rain would it receive in a year? And we're going to say less than 25 centimeters of rain per year. Okay, less than 25 centimeters. What about the grassland? How much rain? Well, they get the maximum of a desert, so 25 centimeters to 75 centimeters of rain per year. So a little bit more than a desert, but definitely not enough to support trees. Okay, now let's talk about the soil. What's the soil like in the desert? What do you usually picture in a hot, dry desert? Hopefully you're thinking sandy or rocky soil. In grassland, um, it has lots of decomposers and grazing animals, and so we're gonna. They have it has very rich soil. Um, let's talk about the weather. What's the temperatures like during the day to night in the desert? Most of us know it, it's hot during the day, cooler at night. And in the grassland, you're going to have actually some seasons. You're going to have warm summers and you're going to have cold winters. So you're going to have a variety of weather through the year. All right, that gives us a start where we need to be for characteristics of the desert versus the grassland. All right, now let's talk about adaptations. But first, um, I think we need to put a definition with adaptation. There's some key words in this unit that we probably need to go over first before we could actually go into physical and behavioral adaptations of the desert grassland. So let me turn this over. And I actually gave you a little word bank to look at right here. Our word bank is going to include adaptation, natural selection, phototropism, geotropism, and biome. So we're going to use those words to fill in these definitions right here. All right, let's give it a try. I'm blocking the camera. Oops, there we go. All right, so a characteristic that helps an organism survive in its environment. Out of those choices, which would better fit for that definition? I'm hoping that you went with adaptation, so we're going to go ahead and write that in. That's what an adaptation is. It helps it survive in its environment. It can be an action, which would be behavioral adaptation, or it can be something on the organism that helps it survive, something physically on it, like the spines of a cactus or the waxy coating of a cactus that keeps water in. A behavior could be like um, uh, estivation, where the reptiles are, will go into a summer sleep when it's extreme drought conditions. All right, let's go to the next definition. The idea that the organism that has the best traits will survive to reproduce, so the best traits are more likely to be passed on. Which word up there would best fit that definition? It's natural selection. We talked about natural selection with the jackrabbit ears. The jackrabbits with the longer ears, they could give off more body heat in the desert, which helped them live a little bit longer. So the ones that are reproducing and passing on the trait were the ones with the longer ears. And so that continues to be the trait that helps them survive longer in that environment, and it keeps getting passed on from generation to generation. Okay, a group of ecosystems with similar climates and organisms. That is actually the definition for biome. So far, we've studied two biomes, the desert and the grassland biome. Next, you have a plant's response to gravity. We have phototropism and we have geotropism. I'm hoping that you remember geo means earth and photo means light. So a plant's response to gravity would be geotropism. And a 
resp- I hope I said that right. A planet's response to gravity is geotropism because everything is pulled down on Earth because of the gravity that's inside the Earth. A planet's response to light would be the phototropism. And the part of the plant that is responding to light would be the stem and leaves. The a part of the plant that's responding to gravity would be the roots. The roots are going to grow down towards the earth. So those are some of the key words that we will have incorporated on our reteach, but also on our reassessment. All right, let's continue on. And since we talked about adaptation, let's review that. A characteristic that helps an organism survive. And I'm going to write it can be physical or behavioral, which would be an action. Physical or behavioral. Okay, so let's go back to where we're talking about the desert and grassland. And a physical adaptation for a desert organism. It could be a cactus. It could be a kangaroo rat. It could be a hawk. It could be um, a snake. You know, we talked about several things. Um, It could be um, the jackrabbit. So a physical adaptation would be something on the organism that helps it survive in the desert. So let's talk about a cactus. Something that helps the cactus survive would be the spines to keep predators away. Also, to keep the water in, it has a waxy coating, which limits the evaporation of the water that can leave the cactus. It kind of seals in. I keep doing that, sorry. It seals in the water. And then you could say... On a jackrabbit, something on him that helps him survive are his long ears to give off body heat so his body doesn't become too hot in the desert. It lets off a lot of body heat. And he's also camouflaged. Those are some things on those organisms that help him survive in the desert. Okay, now let's talk about some behavior. Let me underline these. A behavioral adaptation would be an action that helps an organism survive in the desert. So something animals do to stay cool is they burrow in the ground to live like the kangaroo rat. Um, Also, they are nocturnal, which means, you know, that they come out at night and they sleep during the day because night is a lot cooler. Um, Estivation where they go into a summer sleep when there are times of drought. Now, that's not going to be for all of the animals, of course, um, but estivation is going to be for a lot of our reptiles. Um, you know, that when there's water that's not available, they're, they'll just go in, their bodies will become dormant and become lose, use a lot less energy and go into a summer sleep during the hot, dry summer months. Okay, that gives you an idea of physical and behavioral adaptations for the desert. All right, grassland, physical adaptations. Um, Because we're going to talk about the grasses because that's what it's mainly about. The grasses are going to have... Sorry, I need a clipboard. The grasses are going to have narrow leaves. The narrow leaves um, keep water in because there's not as much surface area for the water to escape the plant. Um, They're going to have extensive root system. So if the top portion of the plant, the grass, is eaten or burned off or damaged in some way, then it's going to uh, continue to be alive underneath the soil with the roots. And also the extensive root system helps them to find water deep down in the soil. Um, also, physical adaptation would be, you can also have camouflage here. You can have sharp teeth. There could be several things on an organism that helps it survive. Well, well that's enough for physical adaptation. For behavioral, you're going to have migration. You can have, um, you're going to have traveling in packs. Because these are going to be actions that help them survive in the desert. 
Um, on the grasses, they have a um, fast reproduction. So the grasses can grow back quickly. All right, so those are some examples of the desert and grassland characteristics and adaptations. All right, moving on. We're going to, since we're talking about grassland, we're going to talk about the plants. And photosynthesis is the process that the plants make their own food using the energy from the sun, the light energy from the sun. So what is that light energy that we call? What do we call that light energy from the sun? That would be radiant energy. The plants are going to soak that up in their leaves, take it in, and then they're going to conserve it and store it inside until needed. And then storing it is going to go from radiant energy from the sun, then they're going to store it inside of themselves until used. And that changes it to another form of energy, which would be chemical energy. Remember, energy is not created or destroyed. It's always just changing forms. So in photosynthesis, it went from radiant to chemical. Which brings us now to... I want to talk about the different things a plant can do. Let's go to the back here. You had some questions before, and I think that we need to answer them again. This is something that you all know. Which part of the plant gets the water into it? That would be the roots. How water gets into inside, inside the plant would be the roots. Now the next question says, which part of the plant gets the glucose, or you could say sugar, from the leaves and takes it to the other parts of the plant? The plant inside of its stem has a um, vascular system. So those are tubes that carry the nutrients you know, from the bottom up or from the top down, depending on what it is. So the sugar is going to be made in the leaves, and the sugar needs to go to all parts of the plant. So it needs to travel down. What do we call that part of the plant where it the tube that it travels, it flows down into the other parts? That would be the phloem. It flows down, carries the food. Next bullet, which part of the plant gets the water from the roots and takes to other parts of the plant? So now it gets the root, the water from the roots, but it needs to go up to the other parts. That's through the xylem. Xylem starts with an X, and it's close in the alphabet to the W, so that's what it carries. Whoops. Xylem carries water. Phloem carries food, which would be the glucose or sugar. Next one, where is sugar made in a plant? And I told you earlier, I don't know if you remember, but it's made in the leaves. Okay, now here's another question right here. If vegetation, remember that's the science word for what? Plants. So if the plants are dying in a drought, they are all dead, how will it impact the rate of erosion? If you don't have plants holding in the soil, are you going to have erosion staying the same? Now remember, erosion is the moving away of sediment. Is it going to stay the same? Are you going to have more erosion by wind or water? Or is it the erosion going to slow down? If you take away the plants, you don't have anything to hold the soil in place, you're going to have an increased rate of erosion. There's going to be more soil being moved away, higher rate of erosion. All right, so since I mentioned weathering erosion deposition, let's go back to this page right here. I have some examples to look at. Whoops, let me finish right now. Two. I wish I could push pause. I'm so sorry. You'll have to wait just a second. Blue all the way to the east. Can you wait just a minute? East coast. Okay, here we go. I knew I left something off there. So you're going to decide which one of these three bullets is describing weathering, erosion, or deposition. So farmers broke up the land to get land ready for growing crops. The key word here, and let me highlight it, is broke up the land. Okay? Broke up the land, that would be our weathering. Okay, next, the soil blew all the way to the east coast and dropped into the ocean. The key words we're looking for is it blew, or blew all the way to the east coast, but here is it is right here, it says dropped. That's what we need to see. What was the end result? It dropped, so that would be our deposition.
Ugh, it's killing me not to have it, this plugged into a clipboard. I'm sorry. Lastly, wind carried the topsoil away. Carried is our keyword here. That's going to be erosion. <laughs> All right, so there we go. I want to look at a food web next. So our food web picture, I want us to look at is from the study guide. Right here. Okay, number 13. Let's look it up close. All right, so let's just say if we look, a food web is just all the overlapping food chains. If we, something happened to the trees, let's say they were poisoned, okay? Poison, all the trees are gone. Okay, who is going to be affected? Who is going to be, die? who's going to die because the trees are all gone? How you figure that answer out is you're going to look at the arrows of where the energy is going. That means who eats it, who consumes the trees. So we have the deer, and we have another arrow leaving the tree going all the way to the squirrel. Okay, so we're going to mark out the deer. The deer is going to be affected in the squirrel. But the thing about the squirrel is, is he eating something else? Yes, you see? Not only does he eat trees, but he eats the bush here, and he eats fungus for some reason. So the deer is going to be affected because, according to our food web, he only eats trees. So if the trees are all killed off, he is going to not survive. Now, why, is it, why does the squirrel have it better off? He has it better off because he eats a variety of foods. So he's lost the food source, but he still has two other things he can choose from and still survive. So eating a variety of foods is going to help him survive better in his ecosystem because if one thing dies off, he still has other things to go to to eat, to survive. Okay, so all of these, the, the trees, the bush, the grass, they're called what in a food web? They are our producers. Okay, now... Um, the producers are going to be eaten by the first level consumers. So an example of first level would be if you start right here at this bush, you're going to go up here. It would be a rabbit. A rabbit would be a first level. A second level would be who's eating the first level, which would be a snake as a second level. And we could even go to a third level, who's eating the snake. Well, we could go to the hawk or we could go to the mountain lion. That would be our third level. Now, where does the original source of energy come from? Where does it first come from for these plants to ever start growing, for all these anim other animals to live for, to eat off of, and to, to live? It's coming, from, the original source of energy is coming from the sun. The sun is the ultimate source of energy where it all begins, that radiant energy. Now, all these organisms, when they die, what happens to their bodies? They decompose, is what I hope you're thinking. They decompose. And when they decompose, all their nutrients from the body go back into the soil. So the soil is enriched with um, nutrients and things can grow again. Now, I want us to look at something on this back page. About My question right here was, how does the mineral carbon get into the soil? Well, I don't know if you all realize this, but every living thing has carbon in it. But even if you didn't know it, that carbon is in every living thing, you can look right here and see the mineral carbon is right here. And if you look above it, it says dead organisms and waste products. See how it's going into the soil? It's because these organisms have died. And when they die, they decompose, and all of the nutrients are going back into the soil, including the carbon. So that's how carbon gets back into the soil, is when things decompose. Um, all right. If you're studying two things, like right here, a scientist studied the population sizes of bison and prairie dogs, two things, bison and prairie, thong, prairie dogs, uh, on the North American grassland for 45 years. Which type of graph would be best displaying? Well, you're comparing two things over time. See, over 45 years, you're going to use a double line graph because you're comparing two things. That's why we say double. We need two lines, one for the prairie dog, one for the bison, and then over time, we use a line graph. What makes our grassland riches? rich soil. 
the reason that grassland soils are so rich is because of all the decomposers and all the um, compost that's being made put into the soil by our decomposers, like worms and um, bacteria. They're breaking down organisms that have died and returning all those nutrients back to the soil. So making compost, which is a natural fertilizer for um, the grasses. And right here we had a question about why would an air plant... Those are the, they have plants that roots stay out in the air instead of in soil survive better in a rainforest than in a desert. Well, you know that the desert is very, very what? Dry. And you don't you're just now learning about the rainforest, but look, it has the word rain in it. What makes what's the difference between a rainforest and a desert is that the desert is too dry, doesn't have enough rain to support it. So that's why an air plant can survive in a rainforest is because it's, there's so much humidity in the air even. Okay, I do believe that is all the information that is pertinent, that is important for you to know to be successful on a retake of your desert and grassland test. I'm hoping this helps and good luck to everyone that's retesting.